Just praise Him for a moment. Just praise Him for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we give you praise and glory and honor in this place today. And we thank you. We thank you. Do you have your Bibles with you? Well, let's go ahead and open them up to Acts chapter 4. Last week we were talking about the fact that we have been called to this age, the church age. And this whole series we've been talking about is the hope of his calling. Well, we have been called as the body of Christ. We have been called to the grace of God. And in talking to others down through the years and different ones, uh, the grace of God is a very, very misunderstood subject in the Bible. And so over the next couple, three weeks here, we're going to talk about the age of grace. We are in the age of grace, God's grace. Can you shout praise the Lord? (laughs) Because that grace is exactly what we need at this point. So Father, we just thank you and we praise you for this message this morning from your heart to ours. We open our hearts, we open our ears and our eyes our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand this morning the power of your grace that you have given to us as the body of Christ. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. Holy Spirit, I'm in your hands. You speak using my voice this morning the words that need to be heard in this place today. And we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles, God gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So with great power, not a big surprise there, but look at this. And great grace was upon them all. God right here ties his grace with his power. The power they received was because of God's grace. I stopped as I read this and I said, okay, Lord, we need the power. Amen? Okay, anybody else need the power of God? All right, we need the power of God right now in our lives. And if it's going to come through your grace, then we need to know how they got it. I want to know, Rob, how they walked in that great power. All right? Let's find out. We read the story here and the whole thing. Peter and John had been arrested and brought before the high priests and were chastised and threatened to stop them from preaching Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the high priest trying to stop somebody from preaching Jesus Christ? Well, the high priests were the uh, religious order of that day. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you look around today and you think about it, nothing and nobody is trying to stop the Muslims from bringing their rugs to school and so on and so forth and doing their prayers and, and so on. What are they trying to stop? Jesus Christ. They're trying to keep Jesus Christ out of the school system, out of the government, out of, out of everything they can. Why? Because he's the one that makes the change. Well, Satan doesn't want people to change their lives. They change their lives for the betterment. So here's P, uh, Peter and John. They're standing there. They're threatening them. They're telling them, we're, we're going to beat you. We're going we're to absolutely imprison you. We're, we're going to put you to death if you keep preaching this. Now watch their response. Verse 19. And Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God you judge. Oh, I think I need to read that again. Did you catch that? Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. And at that point, they let him go. Verse 23, 
And being let go, they went to their own company. They went to their own company. They went to people who were of like faith like them. And they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. All right? I gave them a whole report of what went on in that whole kind of court setting. And so what did the company of Peter and John do? They lifted up their voice and they rehearsed everything and all the threatenings and they talked about everything that the chief priests and the, and the scribes had said. Y'all looking at me. No, that's not what they did. Listen to what they did. And when they heard that report, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You are higher than those threatenings. You are higher than all that report. They rehearsed now who God was to them. They didn't rehearse the report. They began to rehearse who God was to them and went through that whole thing. And then turned around in verse 29, and now, Lord, you behold their threatenings. You behold their threatenings. We're not going to behold their threatenings. You behold them. And watch this. And grant unto your servants that with all boneless they may speak your word. See what happened here? They just turned this thing around and said, hey, just like Peter and John, are, are we going to hold your threatenings to a higher value than what God has told us to do? <laughs> you judge it, because we already have. And the answer is no. We're going to hold what God has told us to do to a much higher level than what you have said. Folks, we've got things going on in the government right now that are trying to make laws that don't agree with what God has said. We, as the body of Christ, do not have to honor those laws. Amen. We honor God's laws and God's word above everything else. Amen. Let me tell you something. You can honor God's words and God's laws above sickness that's attacking your body. You can, you can honor God's word and God's laws above Satan's poverty and lack that's attacking your finances. Hello? Behold their threatenings. Whose threatenings? Satan's. And give us the boldness to speak your word. And look, they connect this with speaking the word. Stretch forth your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done by the name of Jesus. God said in Mark chapter 16, he said, I will confirm the truth with signs following. What signs following is he talking about that he's going to confirm the truth with? Casting out demons, laying hands on the sick and they shall recover, speaking with new tongues. Amen. I think it's time we had some signs in the church. Hello. Signs are not there to convince us that God is right. They're there to convince the world that God is right. And watch this. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Where they were assembled together, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and God gave them the desire of the heart. They spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed. Now let me ask you a question. We got any believers in here this morning? Amen. The multitude of them that believed were in one heart and one soul. And so great grace was upon them to give them 
great power. You got it? They prayed for it. See, we've, we've identified grace. Yes, sir, let me change that. Grace has been identified as something God is doing for you because he wants to do it for you, and it doesn't involve you at all. And it's kind of been used like in this manner that somebody comes up and, and they need healing in their body and oh, we lay hands on them and they fall out on the floor and they get up healed. Oh, well, see, God gave them grace. He wanted to heal them. The next person we lay hands on, they fall out on the floor, get up, and they're, they're not healed. Oh, well, God didn't choose to heal them or give them grace at this point. That's how grace has been used in, in, in the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, we are told that we should know the hope of his calling, but it's all, we're also told that we should know the power of his resurrection. Amen? I don't know about you. I want this great power. I, I'm really, I, I'm to the point... And the only way I can put it is I'm fed up with going out in public and seeing people in wheelchairs and going by hospitals that are full and not having the ability to do anything about it. I don't care if it's a public setting. Well, what are people going to think of you? I don't care. <laughs> but what is that person going to think of God when I'm able to walk over and lay hands on them and they get up out of that wheelchair in that restaurant or that grocery store and they start walking around shouting and praising God in the midst of the public setting? We're coming to that, folks. You're right. We're not coming to it. We're there. Show me the glory. The glory starts with the grace. It starts with the power. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. If you uh, went to our Website and printed out those outline. The outline. There's a kind of a one-page outline there. Hang on to it. <laughs> Not Ephesians. Go to Romans. Excuse me. Romans chapter five. Hang on to it. We're going to be on that outline for a little bit here. We're in the age of grace. Romans chapter five, verse seventeen. Everybody there? Yeah. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Now it did. Move up to verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, that man was Adam, Sin entered into the world, and death entered in as well by that sin. So the sin that Adam did also introduced death into this world, and that death, and you could actually, I read an account uh, on this, that it's, the death there is actually a pluralized word. Deaths. And when you look at that deaths, you're looking at spiritual death, 
physical death, financial death, death of relationships. What does sickness and disease do? Creates death in your body, and so on. So it wasn't just that spiritual death or spiritual separation from God. Adam and Eve also started to die physically. All right? Now watch this. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Ephesians 3, 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. All right? There's truth to that statement. Because from the time, from the time that Adam committed that sin, he now had released that type of nature into everybody that came after him. All right? Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. In other words, there can be no uh, judgment, no punishment, no nothing for something that isn't of the law. Out here on Route 37, we have, as you come into Johnstown, you have a speed limit of 35 miles an hour. When the school, when the high school that's right here across the street is in operation, that speed limit drops to 20 or 25 out there. So if you decide you're going to come in here and I'm going to ignore that and do 100 miles an hour, you're going to get stopped. You're going to be reprimanded for speeding. You're going to get a ticket. And they're going to lighten your checkbook. But if there was no speed limit out here, then you could drive through 100 miles an hour and they couldn't do a thing. Why did God give that law to Moses? Because of sin. So that man would know this is sin and here's the ramifications of it. Hello? Hello? Man's sin put God in a position where he had to do some things he didn't want to do. Hello? Well, let that sink in for just a little bit there. See, God gave man dominion over this earth. He gave him power and authority here. We're going to get into more of that yet. What did Adam do? He literally put his knees on the ground and said, Here, Satan, you take it. You have convinced me that there's a higher level than God. Satan told Eve, if you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God's. They already were. Amen. Hello. They had dominion over this whole thing that God had made. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned or ruled or had authority from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. This word similitude means to that same level. So even though people didn't sin to the same level as Adam, the results were the same. 
See, we as the body of Christ, we put levels on sin. This one's worse than that one, and, you know, this tells us God says sin is sin, period. And we better understand something. There is retribution for sin, period. A little louder, Larry. I don't think anybody else heard you. The wages of sin, there's your retribution. And again, that's deaths. But what does the rest of that verse say? Come on. There you go. God's saying, here's your choice once again. Paul writes this in Romans, the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. Amen? We got a choice again. And here's where the grace comes in. God has given us the ability to make that choice. God's not making that choice for us. We make that choice every day with everything we do. All right? Let me go on with this. Verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. In other words, there's a difference here between the offense that occurred and the gift that God, God has given. The offense that Adam did created sin in everyone from that point on. But the gift that God gives, we have a choice to receive. Are you here? That's what he's talking about. Say, I have a choice. Now poke your neighbor and tell him, I'm going to make the right choice. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more. In other words, what God did for us through Jesus Christ was a much greater and more powerful act than what Satan did with Adam. All right. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. In other words, where sin abounded, Grace abounds much more. Amen? Hallelujah. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift, this gift of grace, is of many offenses unto justification. In other words, that gift of grace will overcome the offenses when we receive it and become justified. All right? Oh, glory. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. Shout, much more. Much more. Much more. They which do what? Receive. receive. They which receive. We didn't have to do anything to receive the sin nature that was created from Adam's sin. But we do have to do something to receive the grace of God. 
Now, this word receive, it has three levels to it, if you would. Number one, we have to accept. Number two, we have to lay hold of. And number three, seize. These are your levels of faith as well. Now listen very closely. We have to accept the grace of God. That's our first step is to accept it for what it is. Mercy and grace are two different things. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve. Okay? Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Mercy, we don't receive what we deserve. Grace, we receive what we don't deserve. Let that sink in for a minute. God's mercy, Josh, says, I don't have to say in that sin nature anymore. Grace says, now you can receive the new birth through Jesus Christ by faith and change your life. Are you all still here? All right. Rob, we're having meat and potatoes this morning. <laughs> okay? Y'all up to speed? All right. They which receive, accept. We've got to accept the grace of God. So to accept it, we've got to know what it is. Then we take hold of it. I accept it as a gift of God. But to take hold of it now is to have it in my hands and have it available to me to work for me. I accept the fact that God has set something out there to help my life called grace. I take hold of it as realizing, Pat, this is mine. It's, it's a gift. Amen. You know, I, I'm sure, <laughs> oh glory, I'm sure some of you at Christmas time have gotten gifts from parents or relatives, aunts or uncles or something, and you looked at it and said, huh? <laughs> really? <laughs> Let's see, who can I give this to next year? <laughs> yeah, make sure aunt or uncle isn't there when, yeah, change families or do something, yeah. <laughs> All right? But have you ever got a gift from somebody and you look at it and say, wow. Wow. And you just kind of have it in your hands for a few moments. And you might think, why did that person give me such a gift? You might even stop and think, I don't deserve this. I didn't ask for this. But it's in my hands. What's the next thing you do? You seize it. To seize it means to take it as your own. Somebody, somebody comes along and here, here you got your gift, Matthew, and boy, you hanging on to it, and I go to take that gift. What are you going to do? Um, Slap my hand and get out of here. That's mine. <laughs> Zeke, sorry. <laughs> hmm? You're going to push him away? No, that's mine. Why are we allowing the devil to steal God's grace from us? 
We've got the authority, the power, and the ability to slap his hand and say, no, you don't, you're not taking that away. Oh, glory. So we seize it. Listen to this. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, and I believe the abundance applies to both, so let me read it that way. They which receive the abundance of grace and the abundance of the gift of righteousness shall do what? Shall do what? What shall they do? What does that mean? Rule. One translation says rule in a king, as a king. So if we will receive God's grace and his righteousness, we're going to reign or rule as a king in this life by one Jesus Christ. I have rule over my life. You have rule over your life. <coughs> Through the grace of God. God has placed back in our possession the same dominion that he gave Adam back in the book of Genesis. Every bit of it. Every, every bit of it. Amen? Now look at... For until the law of sin, verse 13 again, until the law of sin was imputed to the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the Bible tells us about this thing called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, faith, long-suffering, meekness, mildness, uh, temperance, uh, godliness, all, all those, those nine fruit of the Spirit. And the phrase at the end of that, against such there is no law. In other words, if we'll operate that way in the fruit of the Spirit... There's no penalties. There's no retribution for that. That fruit of the Spirit is part of God's grace to us. Ephesians chapter 1 says that, that, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Amen? Well, part of that spiritual blessings is grace. The grace of God. Now, we've defined that grace uh, in some circles as unmerited favor, and it is. It says that. It's an unmerited favor. All right? In other words, it's God doing us a favor. Do you realize the amount or the size of the favor God did for you when he sent Jesus to that cross? When he sent him to death with sin and put him in hell? But he didn't stop there. The favor continued when he resurrected him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of authority, right at the right hand of God. You missed a place to shout right there. And why? He did it all for us. He did it all for his love for us. Amen. Let me see if I can finish this up this morning. <laughs> Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now again, 
Grace is unmerited favor. It's not something we earned. But it's also this, and I really like this definition, and this one really has, has got a hold of me and done something for me. Grace is the influence of God's Word on a man's heart and the reflection of that influence in his everyday life. So the question comes, how much influence does God's Word have in your life? How far has that influence gone? For a good portion of the body of Christ, it has stopped with the new birth. Hello? But to be honest with you, that doesn't matter to you right now. I'll tell you what matters to you. How much of an influence is it on my life, your life, as an individual? And is that influence being reflected out here in the public eye? Hmm. Got pretty quiet in here this morning. How many of you want God's grace, what you've heard so far this morning? Amen. You there? Have you found 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Verse 9. I think in some circles, somehow this verse got taken out of the Bible. For we, shall we, we. poke your neighbor and tell him that means us, and that includes you, we are laborers together with God. We're laborers together with God. In other words, we've got to get connected and work with God's plan and His purpose. Now, you are God's husbandry, you are God's building, okay? The word husbandry there is, it comes from a combination of two Greek words, and I'm not Rick Renner, so just bear with me. One, the first word means soil, the second word means farmer. So we are both the soil and the farmer. We are God's soil and his farmer. Now, I'm not totally in understanding of a lot of things that are being done in this world right now compared to what they used to be. <laughs> so I'm going to go back when we were farming and what we did. We would go out in the spring and take the soil and go through and do what they call till it. In other words, you'd plow it up, dig it up, and then you'd go back through with this tiller that would come through and kind of just kind of shake it and break it loose. Because during the winter, the soil would get a real thick, heavy crust on the top of it. And you kind of had to break that up in order to be able to get the seed to be planted in it. Okay? God says, we're the soil. But he says, we work as laborers with him. We're also the farmers. Paul started this whole conversation here to get to this point with the fact that some plant... Some water, but God gives the increase. All right? I had a, a fellow, I think I've told this before, but I had a fellow who was here. Uh, he was with us a while. and uh, I had been preaching on, on, on something, and uh, 
about three weeks or so, and he had a, a fishing trip that he had planned and was going on vacation and stuff. And he told me, man, I, d I don't want to miss what you're doing, but he says, I paid for this. I'm going on this fishing trip to North Carolina. And uh, so I'm going to be gone next Sunday. I said, okay. So he went on his fishing trip, and he was the type of guy, he would find a church. He found a church down in the area that he could go to. And when he come back from his fishing trip, oh, he come back so excited. And he was talking about the fish he caught, but he said, I really got to tell you about the church we went to and the service and what that pastor was preaching. I said, well, what's that? And he told me. And I'm standing there thinking, well, yeah, that's what I've been preaching right here. And he says, man, I got so much out of it. And he started to tell me, and I'm sitting there, and I just, oh. <sighs> I've been three weeks on this, and you got nothing, and you go to one service with another guy, and you hear the whole thing, and you understand it. And I mean, I'm just a huffing and a puffing. I didn't, I don't think I let him know that. But God, I felt God's finger on my shoulder, tapped my shoulder. He says, what is your problem? Well, he, did, he must not have listened to what I said. He said, he, he did listen. He said, you planted, if you hadn't planted, that pastor wouldn't have been able to water that seed. Whoops. <laughs> We had a session of repentance and <laughs> some are planters, some are waterers, but it's God gives the increase. But God can't increase what isn't there. If you take a note, write that down. God cannot increase what isn't there. So something has to be planted. It has to be planted and you're the soil. And he says here, you're also the farmer. How do we till and dig up this ground? Through praise and worship. That praise and worship, good praise and worship this morning. Well, the Holy Spirit just, just uh, there was a rain falling in this place today. But let me ask our discerner of spirit, what, what did, don't just agree with me. No, I'm not. Okay. Say that? Yeah. There was a soft rain of the Holy Spirit falling in here this morning with our praise and worship. What does that spring rain do? It gets the ground ready for tilling and plowing and getting that ground softened up for the seed. That rain today was falling on us, helping us. We were plowing our ground, getting ready for the seed that God is planting in your heart right now. Hallelujah. Now, we're also that farmer. We've got to look at this and we've got to say, hey, my seed needs to be watered. My seed needs to be watered. What do we do? We go back to praise and worship and we start bringing that rain back to water the seed to allow it to take root and grow. You hear this morning? You getting anything out of this? Let me finish. All right, now. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul is writing this, as a wise master builder. Now I'm going to say something. If Paul who was Saul, could receive the grace of God after what he did as Saul, then you also can receive God's grace. I have laid the foundation and another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is 
Jesus Christ. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. I've asked our intercessors to pray this with me, Psalm 85, verse 6. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? To revive means to restore, to repair, to breathe life into. God's people need to have a new breath of life from God. Amen? All over this all over this country. And that breath, that revival comes, and you can add this, you, those of you who are interceding with me for that, you can add this to it. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, the three waves of glory. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The first wave of uh, glory will be repentance. The second will be a refreshing. The third will be restitution. And when the restitution comes, part of that restitution is what we call the rapture. We will be Gathered up. Hallelujah. You got one more shout left in you or not? Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lynn, come on. And we'll... Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Oh, glory. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you. Father, I praise you for the message you have given us here in this place this morning, a message of truth. And I thank you that this message is being confirmed with signs following. And I praise you for it. I thank you. Signs following in the lives of every person who heard this today, every person who will hear it on the YouTube where it goes. We thank you. We thank you for it. And right now I loose the angels of glory to build a hedge, a blessing wall around every vehicle. Father, we release those vehicles to go down the road without incident, arriving safely at our destinations today. And Father, I ask that you give this congregation peace, comfort, and fullness of life throughout this week. I thank you and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning.